Welcome to the God is not an asshole podcast. If you are one of the many people done with religious dogmatism, hang on. You might sense transcendence, but your church or other faith community never seem to get off the ground. You realize that honoring your conscience means more than fitting in and keeping hard to explain rules? Hang on. You could probably think of the goodness in your tradition, and you tried your best to save that baby, but there's so much bathwater. Join your host, David Norman Moore Jr. in California and Carrie Connolly in New Jersey, who are collaborating to bring on guests who have found life on the other side of fundamentalism. Guests with stories of how they have liberated themselves from beliefs that divide us from each other. None of our guests' narratives are identical, but we hope you'll find something in common with each of them. We invite you to experience our common bond as we all inspire even more of us to embrace the true self. I thought that I was writing the book for my kids or, or, and I thought that I was writing that book to everybody else's kids, but it, 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 in reality, I was writing the book that I needed to hear myself. Um, and so, you know, I slowly over time, um, in the, uh, over the, the, the course of a couple years after that book came out, um, I was able to find the love that I had given everybody else, I mm-hmm. was able to start to discover that love for myself. And, and I was able to come out and, and tell the world that I was gay. And it's, it's a wild experience to embrace God as your full self. It yes. is a beautiful, beautiful thing to be able to come into God's presence and w- without shame, without all of the junk, like I, like, I don't care that my mom and my dad still don't approve of me. I don't, but that they don't get to define God for me. Mm. And, and that's a beautiful thing. That is like the ultimate reclamation of power, I think. Uh, for for you to say, no, somebody else does not get to define God for me. That's a, I mean, that's a powerful I am statement, right? That is a really powerful statement of self. That because because ultimately, I think so much of what organized religion has done is uh, claimed power over, right? <laughs> Whoever it could get power over, and used that power to serve its greed and its warmongering and it's patriarchy and it's homophobia and it's racism and all of those things. Right. And so when you stand back and you go, no, 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 you do, nobody else is going to define God for me. That is such a reclamation of self and, and authenticity and self agency that is, is powerful. And I think that is, is so, um, I think that's so much about what Christ was about. Honestly, I really do. When God, when, when Jesus said the kingdom, and I don't like the word kingdom, the realm of God is within you. When, when Jesus says the realm of God is within you, I think that's the kind of thing that he's talking about, right? That, that I get to, I get to have this relationship and God is going to show me who God is. Right. And when you stop being afraid, the power that everybody else had on you begins to fall away. When, when the, when the people, When the people start to realize that you're no longer afraid, they're going mm-hmm. to paint it like you've fallen away or you've made choices that are against God. And they're going to make all these statements, mm-hmm. but you're not afraid anymore. And so those statements right. don't affect you the same way they affected you when you were 10 years younger. Right. Or however Well, it sounds long like, Matthew, it, it sounds like you have, you know, I don't, you're you're saying that you don't know if you'll ever really get past everything, but it sounds to me like, and and I would like to see if you could go back on this because I'm really fascinated with the Barbie story, and I think you've gotten <laughs> over that, but um, that that's uh, a thing, and and uh, I also want to mention that I was uh, around 59 years old the first time I used the word asshole. And the only reason I used it is because I was having coffee with a guy who did our sound and 
I and and he was telling me a story about all of the stuff that his family dealt with in terms of racism. He he is Guamanian and his parents are white and they lived in a fundamentalist neighborhood. And he talked mm-hmm. about all this stuff. And he says his family would never think about going to church. However, he was coming. And I asked him, why are you coming? And he said, because I found a place where God's not an asshole. And it just, that was it, though, you know? And and so maybe he's going to ask for royalties. But anyway, I, <laughs> I want to I know this Barbie story. I'm just taken by this. Mm-hmm. I think that for me, what I was so struck by is the inherent misogyny of that, too. Like that, the, the messaging of the misogyny that's involved in that story is no Ken, terrifying. Just Barbie, not with yeah. Ken Burns. <laughs> no pen. No, no, there was no, no pen. pen. And yeah. what is interesting is that I'm that's just one story that gives you a really big yeah. picture yeah. review of how weird and odd our version of Christianity was. But I could tell you stories that make that Barbie story seem completely mm-hmm. fine like it seems like it's something mm-hmm. that is like oh wow that's not so bad like i i mean i grew up for three i guess two three years as a kid we had segregated sunday schools wow by gender by race did i but by it was okay it was church kids versus kids that came to school on the bus but or came to church on the bus, came to church on the bus. So wow. So you can imagine, like it was so it was racism, um, it was classism, um, but mostly racism because they did not want the kids who came to church on a bus to affect or impact the kids who went to school, uh, you know, and had their parents, you know, the parents were, mm-hmm. you know, right there with them. And so I did I I mean it was it was years before I realized what that was that I experienced. And not what only what it was, but it. yeah, and the the messaging and that I, it embedded I, in. You know, you. and so like it is um I, I mean I just remember my my parents being so concerned mm-hmm. about the church kids experience, you know, being around kids that might make choices that are outside of the church's guidelines and, you know, mm-hmm. and, 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 and not even, and, and, you know, never being able to actually say, Hey, it's also because most of the kids on the buses are black. And most of the kids who go to church every Sunday with their parents in the church are white. And so like it, you know, I mean, I, it, it, years would go by for, before I realized what it, what that was. Now, Eventually, well, okay, let me they did away quick. with that. So were the black kids there when they burned Barbie? Because they might have might not have minded so much. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, there were there were uh, there were black kids in the in that classroom. Yes, <laughs> you're but you're very right. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't cheer, did they? <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny uh, i love it well i mean you know and, th- and then there were also weird things where um a yearly boxing match that my pastor would have with somebody dressed up as satan and, I heard and so about that was those. this spectacle that we that that we all looked forward to seeing because who was gonna win the pastor or the devil and so, anyway, so, yeah, I was just like, yes. there was just yes. really odd, odd things that happened, you know, growing up. Yeah, yeah. So, so I just, I'm, I'm still really curious about um, the the process of your discover- discovery because I know I have mine, and I have my own journey to my authentic self, right? And I think David and I were talking a little bit about that in our first episode. Um, that the journey to, I think, the authentic self so often includes those things that we are the most ashamed of, right? And so we keep hidden and can only come out in in 
our, our shadow work and the healing of our shadow of our shadow and fu- fully integrating ourselves. Right. And as we, as we do that work, a huge part of the healing is finding and discovering that God who is present and cherishing even those parts of us that we are most desperately trying to hide away. Right. And, um, and that, that is a, a, a loving presence, a, a God that is, is with us in that. And so I'd love to know a little bit more about what your experience, what, what were some of the things that maybe guided you? So for people who are listening, maybe there's somebody who is where you were in 2006, just beginning your deconstruction. What were some of the things Mm -hmm. that pointed you besides the atheist and the Clinton supporter, the Democrat, right? Which I think are awesome. Like those are great, great ways. Surrounding yourself with people who are different is great. But what are some of the things that pointed you down that path? that made you go, yeah, there's, there's a God who is present and, and madly, radically, recklessly in love with me. It was, it was a hundred different things, mm-hmm. but I'll tell you, there was something that woke up in me after watching how the country reacted to Hurricane Katrina and watching mm. the, the white supremacy and the racism and the and the um, just the the differences that President Bush treated the people in Mississippi, the white people in Mississippi, versus not even visiting the people who were in New Orleans during that event. And there was something that woke up in me because I, my, my of course, my politics was so interconnected uh, with my faith, and I was like, something is wrong with how our faith directs Mm -hmm. the actions that we take as people who do politics and people who do society. How can I use my vote, use my voice, use my personhood to help affect change for the other person, whoever that other Mm -hmm. person was? Like, Mm -hmm. what can I do? And so like there was as soon as that, as soon as that became a thing in me, like that seed started like sprouting and this started like really becoming um, a part of my story. I, I, you know, it, it was my actions that sort of took over. Like I immediately started making changes. So that was the thing that was like the immediate. When people would ask me how I would theologically explain that, I would. I, I I was like, I just don't think it matters. I don't think it matters. Like for me, it's loving people. Like if we're called to love people, how can I do that with what I've been given? Okay. Uh, how can I do that, that, that in a way that is going to inspire a ch- change that, that affects the, 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 the systems at play? Because I, you know, like, it, it, like any, like so many white kids raised in American suburbia, we, I, I was blind to my, not only how systemic racism was, I was blind to my part in it. I was blind. Like mm-hmm. if you, like I was blind to like the, 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 uh, the racisms that I had inside me. And mm-hmm. so as soon as I stopped focusing on me and protecting me and um, making sure that everything was right for me, if those things started to crumble. And then you meet mm. people, you meet somebody who has a completely different way of thinking about God, and it, it affects you. You meet somebody mm-hmm. who, uh, you know, is gay and really wants to have, you know, a relationship with God, and you, 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 you start, you're like, how can I make room for that person? And so it just, it, it goes okay. from there. So it was, it was the people that I met and the people that I, it was, it was all of the other people that changed God for me. Mm. And it opened up opportunities for me to see God in a more open, non-gendered, you know, not, you know, regardless of orientation, like it just like, it, it started to open that up. And then you, you know, I became friends with people like Rachel Held Evans and, and, you know, uh, uh, people, other people who were in that story and, and they were doing different things and they were making, uh, you know, uh, like not only 
not only doing things differently, but actually theologizing it. Mm -hmm. And, and you, and you start to wake up. Oh, wow. This, the progressive God is in scripture. If I really need to go back and use scripture just to to define this, I can go find this God. Mm -hmm. So that's beautiful. You used a word, Matthew, that I don't ever think I've heard before. But I think it's loaded. You you talked about what was inside of you, and you described it as racisms, plural. Mm. Yeah, boy, c- can you yeah. unpack that a little bit? Yeah. Um, oh, you know, racism is not one thing. It's a, like you are ra- you are raised to have an understanding of, uh, you know, you're raised with whiteness, and so this whiteness that I was you know, controlled by or only saw everything through, you know, I, there was a racism for uh, black people and a racism for Asian people and a racism for Jewish people and a racism for all of the various groups of people that you meet. Like, and it was, you know, for some, for some uh, racism, um, it was this just, not even caring about their story, like not even not even acknowledging the story of the indigenous person. And like, and so okay. like you just so I, I do say racisms um, because it was it, it's not that's it, it's more than it's one, that. I think. Wow. Yeah, that's powerful. Mm-hmm. That's really powerful. And then there are, you know, as I think for me, a big part of my own deconstruction as a, as a woman, right. Is, is removing the patriarchy and looking at, you know, when I, when I think about, because honestly, for, for me, a big part of the, my deconstruction began when I had to kind of really come to terms with, um, how I felt about the, the, I, I would, as I had a lot of privilege around, homophobia right around around being in a in a church i could easily just ignore the question but because it didn't affect me right which is ultimately privilege right but then i had little babies and i i had to ask myself the question like if if the time when the time comes that they begin to explore that and if somebody comes to if one of them comes to me and tells me that they're gay there is no way in hell i'm gonna let anybody tell them that they are somehow less worthy. And I had, that was the start of my, my uh, really wrestling with that question, because I was like, there's no way that I'm going to let somebody say that. Not even God is going to get to say that about my kids. You know what I mean? And so I had to mm-hmm. find that God. Um, and patriarchy and homophobia are, are such close bedfellows, right? They are so close. Um, they come from the same toxicity and so as does racism right and so the the um really de- unpacking that and my belovedness and equality in belovedness with anybody else as a woman was just as important for my and and women's wisdom reclaiming w- women's wisdom was just as important for me in my own deconstruction as, as anything else. And so I'm curious if you have any thoughts on, on patriarchy and how patriarchy does harm to men as well. You broke up for just a second. Can you repeat the very last part of your question? My, my very last, yeah, my question is, I'm wondering if, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about the ways in which patriarchy combined with racism and homophobia does harm to men as well, especially men in, in the church? Well, <laughs> I was raised in devout patriarchy, um, not only just from a uh, church way of thinking, um, and, you know, the, but also from a father being over the household kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. and, it, it's, um, and it's something that is honestly still very affecting in my story because i uh when i came out uh, as gay um 
my father has not had a conversation with me since. And, and so it's, um, when you lose communication with your dad, because your dad is disappointed in you, or your dad, like you are an embarrassment to your dad, you have to find other ways to, uh, you, you, you just got to find your way through. And the, so the patriarchy, like the fact that I would not only identify as gay, but become, but come out and be proud of who I am, that flies in the face of everything my dad believes and everything, uh, uh, every way my dad identifies as not only a man, but as a friend to all the people that he is friends with and as a person mm-hmm. in his hometown. And he can't even have conversation with me beyond the very short text message on a special occasion. Mm-hmm. And so it is, um, you know, it, 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 patriarchy has defined my own story very deeply because it's not only just with me and my dad, but also just me feeling this pressure when I, fir- I remember when I first had kids, um, Jessica and I, before, when she became pregnant, we, we said we were going to break the cycle of, of spanking in our, in our, uh, in our, our family story. So we, you know, we said, we're not going to spank our kids before our kid was even born, because that's the only way you break that, that cycle. And you would have thought that we, again, you would have thought that I had announced to my family that I was going to encourage my kids to, you know, do lines of cocaine on, you know, (laughs) on every Tuesday. And, and so, and so it was, it was a big deal. But I remember mm-hmm. the stress that I felt every time my kids ta- were in front of my dad. Would their behavior, would their behavior be good enough? Or would they show me the respect mm-hmm. that he expected? Like, mm-hmm. so the pressure that, that my mm-hmm. kids are here for me to get, get praise and get some sort of honor from. And I'm like, it's oh. just, you, you wake up to it and it's like, oh, shit. Yeah, like that is wow. That that is the interesting experience, and that's also the um, that is also the quintessential core definition of patriarchy is that everybody else is there to serve the male ego, and and right, right. like to serve you, everybody else around the male is is a reflection of the male is indicative of his worthiness in the eyes of this psychopathic patriarchal God and the, the men that that God loves to love him. So would, whatever, would you say, like Matthew, that. that your, your, the system in which you grew up was threatened by Liberty? <laughs> we wouldn't have said that, but I could, yes, yes, we definitely, <laughs> it was definitely threatened by Liberty. And you know what, what's weird, what's weird is to see, you know, there was a, there, there was, uh, there were a few years when I thought that America's understanding of God was going to evolve. Like I thought that it was going to become something bigger than what, like the, the evolving Mm -hmm. of what we thought uh, about God was going to expand and there was going to be a, 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 a bigger openness to, um, exploring God in different ways. And much to my, you know, uh, surprise, I guess, um, we, we have to come full circle. And the American God that is celebrated in politics and celebrated in, you know, uh, so on social media by like, you know, conservative uh, talking heads is is really not that different yeah. mm-hmm. than the God That's right. that I was grow- that I grew up with. They're doing yeah. all the same things. And it's not like there's they're they're even they're not even talking about 
you know, the love thy neighbor God anymore. Like no one even mentions love thy neighbor. Like once in a great while, my pastor would talk about the pastor I grew up with. Like he would talk about how we are supposed to be loving our neighbors. All right. It didn't necessarily articulate it in a way that inspired much love, but we did hear it. Today, we could go on a bit about God expecting us to love people who we live next to. And so okay. wow. it's That's a heavy. really st- weird thing to be, to come back full circle to, to being, feeling the oppression, feeling the, um, the whiteness, feeling the, um, the various isms really, really uh, defined in, in, in how people are pontificating God now. Um, yes. It's just, it's like there's no, it's like they, the, like Jesus is no longer a part of the story for them. Like you never get any sense of, of, of the humanity or mm-hmm. the, the, um, the light and the salt that God describes us yes. as, um, that Jesus yeah. described us as. And it, it's, mm-hmm. it's just, it's a, it's a weird place because we are this rigid asshole God is <laughs> very much loud and proud and dogmatic and looking to control various sy- systems all over again. Yes. So as we wrap up, because we've been talking for an hour and I could talk to you for many more hours um, because I just could. Um I'm curious. I th- I think that there is nothing uh, that art can be such amazing resistance to exactly what you were just describing, and I think um, just your insistence on being and your authenticity and and your reclamation of nobody defining God for you. I think all of that is is this beautiful, gorgeous uh, act of resistance against all of that kind of oppressive power, and. I, I know that you already recited it once. I, I was going to ask you like, okay, well, what would you, what would you love people who are uh, uh, going on a similar journey to know? But as I sat here and thought about it, I think I would, if it's okay with you and David, I would love to maybe have you recite what you, what you already read to us earlier from your book, because I think that in and of itself would be such a beautiful way to end our time together. And of course, if you have something else you want to say, please say it. Mm. Um, but I would love to end with that. And I think, because I love this image of God, God singing, hovering over us and singing a song over us of affirmation. Right. And, and I used that image that I got, um, with my children so that every morning I would wake them up and I would say, good morning, beautiful Delaney, good morning, gorgeous, handsome, you know, powerful, smart, intelligent Delaney or Evan, I, you know, it's time to bring your greatness to the world because that idea of God hovering over us and singing a song of affirmation is so beautiful. And I would love it if you would say whatever you want to say and then end us out with reciting yeah, no. your beautiful words. Is that okay? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the words of the book do that talk and we'll just leave it there. You, Sounds great. you, when God sees you. God delights in what is and sees only what's true. That you, yes, you, in all of your glory, bring color and rhythm and rhyme to God's story. So be you, fully you, a show-stopping review. Live your life in full color, every tint, every hue. Discover, explore, have faith, but love more and learn and relearn all that God made you for. Mm. I love that. I have chills. I appreciate your empathy. Maybe I should should say your empathies. Um, and, <laughs> you know, going back to the use of, the, you know, the term racisms, uh, it, it, is, it indicates your, your empathy. And it made me think also uh, how how personal that is, because then my mind went to the word ableisms. And 
you know, it just honors the diversity of, of people. So thank you. Thank you, Matthew. It's always such a pleasure to be in your presence. Thank and you. I'm so grateful to have you on here. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here today. We are people who have left behind performance-based religion and the shame that comes with it. Maybe you have a personal liberation story to tell and we want to know about it. Please contact us on Twitter at God is not an asshole or text 805-703-8393 because the world needs to know that God is not an asshole.